Wells behind the camera, a camera focused for this program on a fairly out of the way and little known corner of Europe, the land of the Basques. We place this camera directly on an international border. Over on that side is the ancient kingdom of Navarre, and there, where the low Pyrenees start ambling down to the sea, is France. It's still pretty heavily guarded up here, and for quite a time after the war in Spain, this border was closed, tight, a sort of miniature iron curtain. At least that was the theory. But in war, a piece old times are new to the people who actually live up here. This border has always been more of a theory than a fact. A theory of the French and Spanish governments whose vigilant customs officers patrol it. No, the people who live here are neither French nor Spanish. They're Basques. And the rise and fall of other republics, other kingdoms has never made them forget it, that they're Basques. And that Basques are what Basques are. Well, what is a Basque? All we know for sure is what a Basque is not. Besides not being French or Spanish, a Basque is not Mediterranean, Alpine, Magyar, Celtic, Germanic, Semitic, nor Scandinavian. He isn't even there yet. Nobody knows who his ancestors were. According to him, Adam and Eve were pure Basque. And it's true that his position is something like the Red Indians in America. He's an aboriginal. He was in Europe before the other Europeans came along. To this day, he speaks his own weird language, a tongue no expert has ever been able to trace. Over there, in General Franco's half of the Basque country, this language is quite literally against the law. It's treason to speak it in Spain, so of course, since Basques will be Basques, their language is spoken just a little bit more on the Spanish side. What we're hearing now isn't part of some Basque conversation. It isn't a war hoop. It's a sort of call, a signal, sung from France to Spain. It has to do with pigeons. There they are. Believe it or not, those pigeons are flying directly over the regular smuggling route. They do it every year. Every day, more than a thousand people smuggle something or other across this border. I don't know how many pigeons there are up there, but I can assure you that smuggling is the biggest industry in these parts, except during the pigeon season. These are German and English pigeons, very orderly and methodical pigeons, and they turn up annually at this border, just at this time, just here, where the Basques on both sides, working in perfectly illegal and harmonious cooperation, catch them. Catch is the right word, too, because here, pigeons aren't shot at. The rifle fire is only a sound effect, produced by that long strip of cloth on the pole. This saves ammunition and persuades the impressionable German pigeon that he is being shot at. Those wooden discs, suggesting at the same time that he's being chivied by hawks. But in fact, he and the rest of his flock are only being rounded up and corralled. A maneuver of the highest intricacy and beauty that begins in France and ends in Spain where the birds are netted out of the sky, like fish. That's a Basque invention. So is whaling. Yes, the fantastic notion that the world's biggest creature could be hunted and harpooned from an open boat was actually dreamed up by the Basque sailors on this coast. Let's not forget the beret, either. Every Basque invents the beret all over again when he puts it on. There seems to be no end to the angles, no limit to the variations of individual tilt. They have their own customs and costumes, of course, and their own music, their own dances. Most important of all, their own ball game, Pelot. I think we'll keep our cameras mainly focused on that ball game. A lot is the overall name, Yoko Garbi, Grand Chister, Rebo, Fronton. What we know is High Line are all variations. Everybody up here plays some form of it. All you really need is a ball and a wall and a little Basque blood in your veins. Well, I haven't any of that, and I'm no Pelot player, but I've grown so fond of this part of the world that I do feel somehow related to it. That orchestra you've been seeing and that you're still hearing, 
It's called the Estudiantina. Hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's a group of teenagers who get together in a little village in the Basque country and make that nice music. And the guitar player happens to be an American, an 11-year-old American friend of mine. We're going to meet him in a minute. There's a man who loved the Basque country more than I do. Really more because he lived here longer. I've never lived here. I'm just a visitor. I came down to visit him and his family. It was Charles Wharton Baker, the writer, a great friend of mine, a great man. And he died just a little while ago, and I came down here to see his family. Of course, the first thing I did was to look up his 11-year-old son, Chris, whom you've seen playing the guitar. I went over to the school just after hours, and the kids came rushing down out of the school and streaming through the streets. And the first thing they did was go to the Pelot court. Chris, come here. Hey, Chris. Hi. What are you doing? What are you playing? Playing Pelot. Pelot? That's a far cry from baseball. American boy to be playing Pelot. I don't even know the rules of the game. Are you a champion? No. You aren't? Well, who is? Introduce me to the champion. Bernard. Bernard, that's your best friend. Well, hello, Bernard. Bonjour. Bonjour. Well, if you're the champion of this particular group, Bernard, uh, you must have begun when you were quite young. Ask you. Three years old. Three years old. Well, people, people of all ages play this game. Sheep herders and mountaineers, the smugglers, the fishermen. And they come in on their days fishing as soon as they've weighed in their catch and they get right over to the pelot court and start a game. <laughs> yes, a Basque is practically born with a pelot ball in his hand. Fishermen just off their boats like these. Priests like this who've just finished saying mass and up in the mountains, shepherds, and most important for the local economy, smugglers. All divert themselves with some form of this vigorous game. It's supposed to be older than the Roman occupation. And there's a legend that the first game of all was played in the Garden of Eden using the apple for a ball. Yeah. Well, there's one thing. Before Chris climbs out of the cherry tree, I'd like to ask him a question that a lot of people have asked me. Is there any money to be made out of this game? Do people make money out of it? Well, the professionals are paid, I reckon, and they, they bet on each other. Come on, give me a cherry. I'm hungry. That's right. Well, this is uh, Grand Schistera. It's the official name. What we're watching here. Hi, Chris. Hi. Who's that wonderful, wonderful player there, Chris? Oh, he's uh, Vichinari. It's the best, the uh, one who plays best. He on is. This court. On this court. Is he the best player in the, no, of the, the game? No, he's the second best player, and I'd rather he win. Who's the head of that other team there? That's uh, Paul Angie. Oh, I know him. Yeah, from the drugware store. The drugware store? <laughs> the hardware store. The hardware store, that's right. We saw it. That ball really goes, doesn't it? Violently. Sometimes it's hit near me and it scares the... It scares me. Well, it hits people sometimes. I know it does. There's a story about somebody being killed by one deliberately. Oh, that yes. I heard. Who was that? Pierre Kites. He was a famous player, and he he uh, yeah. he threw a ball at uh, at the chief of police, didn't he? Yes. Because the chief of police wanted to arrest him, and uh, so he just threw the ball during the game and knocked him out, killed him. Well, it's a great game, isn't it? Well, it's all right, but it's for the tourists. Now, come on, Chris, you, <laughs> you don't mean that they play this game just to please the tourists. Well, yes, they sort like of. They game. like Yoki Garvey better. And so they like Yoki so Garvey, Garvey better than Grand yes. Chester. Well, why? Because, uh, well, it's, ha it's... It's like this, isn't it, Yoki Garvey? Yeah, but it, there's a shorter basket, and so the ball moves faster. Because the basket is shorter, the, yes. the game is quicker. Well, okay, we'll... 
We'll go over a little later and take a look at Yoki Garby. A ball and a wall. That's the basis. Now, that particular wall, as a matter of fact, is the only one I've found in this country where a lot is actually forbidden. Not that anybody seems to be taking the sign very seriously. I think maybe if it had been written in Basque, that sign, instead of French, they might have obeyed it. See, what they're really doing is upholding the Basque right to play Palot wherever they feel like it, indeed, Basque rights in general. Because, of course, the Basques are law-abiding people, even if they, if they don't take a French sign very seriously, and even if they practice the ancient and tricky and rather skilled profession of smuggling. There's an old Basque saying that as the horns are to a bull, so is his word to a Basque. Well, Chris. Yeah. You're an honorary Basque. What does that make you as a Palat player? How's your game? Oh, I'm not so good. Well, you play Palat. What do you mean you're not so good? Well, I've, I've only been here seven years. Seven years, and that doesn't make anybody a Palat player. What do you do? I guess you have to be born a Basque to be a real Palat player. Yeah. There's some five-year-olds. They seem to be doing pretty well. Oh, they start even before that. They do? Yeah. There's a very good one there, so you can see him. He's a champion. What's his name? Robert. That's right, Robert. And who's the, who's the comedian in the group? Oh, he's Don Luis, best friend. The kids, you'll notice, are hitting with clenched fists, bare hands. That's the name of the game, Manu. When they're older, they'll be playing with a ball that's very much harder. We've said that everybody in the land of the Basques is a Palot player, but of course that isn't exactly true. The female half of the population begins with hopscotch, which is an international game if ever there was one, and then graduates to the Fandango. The gentlemen try to keep up. Remember little Robert, five-year-old champion we saw working out against the church wall a few minutes ago? Well, we persuaded him to submit to a brief interview on some technical aspects of Pelot. Bonjour, Robert. Bonjour. Introduce us to your friends, his amis. Louis Jean Louis, puis Louis Jean Martin, puis Louis Didi, puis lui Jean Bernard. Jean Bernard. Qu'est-ce que c'est ça que, que tu as dans la main? I'm asking what he has in his hand. C'est pas là. And of course, he explains that's the paddle. Tu aimes jouer? Oui, monsieur. Tu étais à l'école? I'm asking if he's been to school. Oui, monsieur. Qu'est-ce que c'est que tu as fait dans la cour? Écrire. I ask him what he's done in school, and he says he writes. Qu'est-ce que c'est que tu as écrit? Feu. I ask him what he writes, and he says F. Bon. Now I think we ought to have the champion give us a little demonstration. Uh, Montre-moi. Avec l'autre main. This is very important in the game, the changing of the hands. L'autre main. Oui, monsieur. Oh, merci, Robert. Bravo. Well, it's no wonder that so many great tennis champions are Basques, because, of course, Pelot's the best training in the world for it. Barotra, for instance, who was born just around here, the great French champion, he was he was tennis champion more than 25 years ago, and then French champion just a couple of years ago again. Told me that he attributes a lot of his stamina, and particularly his footwork, to what he learned as a kid on pelot courts. And speaking of champions... I don't suppose there's any doubt that Robert's going to be a great champion. Pretty much depending on which town they come from, these future champions will be playing either with a big hand basket of Grand Chistra or with a smaller one used in Yoki Garby. And here it is, Chris's favorite game. Yeah. Yoki Garby. Now, what does it mean, Yoki Garby, Chris? Well, Yoki Garby means the game pure. They think it's a better game. A purer game? Yes. Truer game. Maybe an older game. Do you figure an older game also? I should think so. Yeah. It's a lot faster, isn't it, because the, the, that basket, basket is, shorter. is shorter, yes. I understand the basket began as a fruit basket or a fish basket or something, like one yes, of the I first, so. uh, first uh, great players tied to his hand.
we're watching now is as important a part of Basque life as Pelot. This is the Fandango, famous Fandango. And dancing it, correct me if I'm wrong, Chris, is uh, the champion Pelot player that we saw playing Gran Chistra a little earlier. Yeah, Michin Daritz. Michin Daritz. And with him is another Pelot player? No, it's the shoemaker. Well, he's the shoemaker and... Couple of the girls. And they're, they're girlfriends. <laughs> Who's making the music? Well, there's the butcher, the baker, yeah. and the spark plug maker. You're kidding. No. <laughs> the, the three musicians, uh, that seems to be their profession, butch, butching and baking and and uh, candles there. No, spark plug making. Yeah. And that, the footwork is, of course, wonderful. Yeah, sometimes they dance around a glass of wine. Without spilling the wine? Yeah. And the old lady who's so light on her feet, the large lady, what well, she do? she's a peanut seller. The local peanut vendor. Yeah. It's Sunday today, and we can see the people coming down from church, passing the Pelot court. It's a funny thing about church, isn't it, uh, Chris? The they, they men and women in the Basque country sit separately in church. Yes, right. the men are in the galleries upstairs, and the women are downstairs. And it's funny because the only church I know of where they separate the sexes is the Jewish church. Just the opposite there. Yeah. Yeah. This is a popular version of Pelot up here in the mountains. It's Manu, bare hand. Well, this priest was quite famous a little while ago when he smuggled the Finley children over into hiding in Spain. The kids have been refugees. And some relatives had turned up and wanted them back, but the kids wanted to stay with their adopted family, and Father Ibarbaru carried the smallest on his back, using the regular smuggler's route over the mountains. And when he returned that day as a cover, he played a game of pelot. Quite a man. Well, he lost the game. The kids are in Israel. No matter what your opinion may be on the matter, it's sure that the good father was doing what he thought was right. And he certainly plays a good game of pelot. I think we'll take one of our cameras over and give you a close-up of that hand. They say that the right hand of a Basque is twice the size of the left and that there's an extra bone in it. I don't know whether that's true or not. Well, that's a legend. That's just a legend. Well, this country's full of legends. and Many of them have to do with Pelot and fabulous Pelot players. And surprisingly enough, quite a few of them seem to be true. There's the great Pekain who played in bare feet and won a championship, even though the court had been covered by the opposition with a thick layer of carpet tacks. Now, there was a tough man. He had a... He had a fairly uh, tough wife, too, and she made a lot of trouble for him. And one day, he came home late. I think it was eight days late that he came home, and uh, she did that thing that wives do sometimes. She clammed up. She didn't say a word, just lay in bed and stared. And he said, uh, uh, good evening, and she didn't answer. And he said, uh, what's wrong with you? And she didn't answer. And he said, don't you feel well? And she didn't answer. And uh, Perkain went away and got... Uh, got the local priest and came back and proceeded to give her extreme unction. There's <laughs> a story that ought to make a lot of husbands happy. What we're watching now is Rebo. R-E-B-O-T. That's, uh, that's the oldest, am I right? And also the most complicated, certainly the most complicated to watch because of the different elements in it. Or the, the basket tied to the hand, and also a glove. A couple of players have a leather glove, as you'll notice. What's the glove for, Chris? Well, they act as human nets. The, the glove ones. Yes. Mm. And what about uh, what about that uh, funny thing in the middle there that the server uses? Well, that's called a butari. What? That's called a butari. Well, I'm glad you told me. <laughs> and 
And uh, the anyway, what do you do? You bounce, bounce the ball off, off that. that, and they send it to the wall. Yeah. How's it scored? Like tennis. And what we're listening to, that wonderful sound, that continuous singing, is the uh, is the scorekeeper. Sings the score. I never heard that in a tennis game. It's a wonderful noise, I think. I think it improve a tennis game. People sang the score, yeah. don't you? Know? There's another yarn about this Pecaine I like. He was supposed to be playing a championship match against a team of Spanish Basque across the border, but he took sick. He'd come down with typhus. He told the doctors he'd have to play, but the trouble was he was dying. He asked them, any news of the game? And they said, no. And he said, pity, I would have liked to have known how it came out. And breathed his last and died. <laughs> Tell us the name of that song you're playing. It's a famous Basque song. I know, we've been hearing it before. Could you give us the words? Those are the Basque words. Would you translate them for us? Children, you must learn Basque to speak, to play polite, and to dance properly. Children, you must learn Basque to speak, to dance properly, to play the lot. You know, I remember Chris's father saying to me uh, a few months before he died that he'd always be grateful for the years he'd spent in the Basque country, but that he always regretted not having come here sooner, not having spent part of his childhood here so that he could do the things in the Basque song. Speak Basque and dance the fandango, play palot. Well, Chris seems to be doing very nicely. <laughs> Here we are back where we started, up on the border. You know, it's not only the Basques. Nobody really likes an international border. The nations it divides always want to push the border back a bit in their favor, and I rather think the people it divides are just as soon do away with it altogether. Well, Pentecost is one day of the year when that actually happens. And here it is, happening. Yes, the fences and frontiers are really down, and people are free this one day to move without passports, carrying what they want in any direction that pleases them. It's like a big party. I can't think of a better reason for celebrating. Good celebration, of course, ends with fireworks. And here in the Basque country, of course, they have a special kind of fireworks. Everything's special here. This, this great thing you see is called a toro de fuego, a, a, a bull of fire. It's shaped like a bull with 
all kinds of fireworks sticking out of it, and men are inside, and they're running through the streets with it, with the fireworks shooting out in every direction into the people's faces. But for some reason, miraculously enough, and I don't know why, nobody ever seems to get hurt. Well, it's, it's time to close. And I think I'd, I'd like to end this time with a Basque ending, where they end every story, every Basque story. And I warn you, it's a little tough. It's not a bit sentimental. It's very much on the realistic side, and therefore very Basque indeed. At the end of a story, a Basque story, they don't say, and they lived happily ever after. Now, here in the Basque country, they say, and if they lived well, they died well. <laughs>